Good evening and welcome to Plain Talk. My name is Christopher and thank you very much for joining me this evening. And on Plain Talk this evening, I have a guest who has just been elected by his party to be his party's presidential candidate for the upcoming general and regional elections. As you would have seen from your screen, the person is Mr. Ralph Ramkaran, not a novice by any means on the political scene, and so not much introduction necessary. In fact, you've been on Plain Talk quite a few times. I Ralph. have been, and thank you once again for inviting me, and it's a great pleasure to be here. Well, I must tell you this, and I, I don't know whether there's any meaning but after David Granger had won the nomination at the APNU, he, the first interview he gave was on plain talk. I would say, therefore, that this is a very significant occasion. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Let's start with you, and we, we, we'll get to what, what I want to discuss with you this evening, your own life in politics how you manage politics and, and the profession of law. Your you, 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 the journey you've made to where you are now, um, where you would like to see Guyana go, and the vehicle by which you want to do it, and you're in United Guyana. So let me start by asking you, is politics in your blood? <laughs> I presume, I believe it is. It's very difficult for me not to be thinking about ways in which Guyana can move forward politically, economically, and otherwise. So I, I presume I derived it from my childhood and the, the upbringing that I had with my father being in politics. So yes, it's, um, it's uh, in my blood, if you want to put it that way. Now, you have sons, grown sons. Are they, are they, we, we talk about this in the blood. Are we seeing the Ram Karan dynasty? No, you're not seeing the Ram Karan dynasty. They, um, I have two sons. Uh, Nikhil, the big one, is not interested in politics. And he made some scathing remarks about politicians recently and I took him up in public. <laughs> um, my younger boy is interested in, Kamal is interested in civil society operations. Both have political views, but Kamal is more interested in contributing to Guyana in, in civil society. He was just uh, president of the Guyana Bar Association. You have been a member or you were a member of the PPP and the PPP Civic. How long were you a member of that party? I was in the, I joined the party as a youngster. I was a teenager. I was about 15 years old. I joined the Belair Lilyandal group, which was used to function in Belair. Its meeting place was in Belair. And I was very active in those years also in the progressive youth organization and fundraising and so on. Uh -huh. So I really became very active when I was about 18, I remember. Mm -hmm. I was uh, a polling, polling agent in the 1964 elections, and I, I marked that as the time that I really became active in politics. I became active then, and I never stopped. What would you say was the driving force that led you into politics and kept you in politics? The dr driving force that led me into politics was the struggle for independence. It was a time of, in the early 60s, it was a time of great excitement, great agitation. And for a teenager, it was great fun also. Mm -hmm. the and great leadership. You had Forrest and, Burnham, you had Chetty Jagger. And great leadership. And the time, um, and there were these huge rallies and huge events. And my father took me to all of these things. I traversed the entire Guyana with him, uh, 
take it, I went to public meetings with him, all these big events and, and so on. As, as I grew older, I went to them on my own. Yes. But my father really introduced me to all these things, not, not for any political purpose. He took me because I was his son. Uh -huh. And I wanted to go, I presume. And uh, eventually I began to go on my own. But did he encourage you? He, did, like, he gave no, en no overt encouragement. Now, your father, um, he was, he is still generally regarded as one of the men with the sharpest wit yeah. in the National Assembly. Yeah. It, his powers of repartee and um, exchanges, yeah. even with the legendary Forbes Burnham yeah. in terms of, of oratory and that type of thing. Uh, how, what kind of education Boise Ramkran had? He was the first in the Bel Air community that went to high school. Mm -hmm. uh, he, was my, uh, he was the eldest child of, of, of my grandfather. Uh, the eldest child and he was a boy of course and where and why and how he went to high school um, I don't know because um, the next son none of the daughters went to high school mm -hmm. of course yeah. in those days girls didn't go to high school um, but his, the son which came after my father never went to high school himself Mm -hmm. I don't know if he had the aptitude, and my father had the aptitude, but my father attended modern high school with some famous names, including um, Art Chung, pre the former president, mm -hmm. uh, the late president Art Chung, who never stopped reminding me whenever I met him while he was alive that my father and him went to the same school. Wow. <laughs> now, your father was a staunch supporter of Chedi Jagan and, and the, the politics and the ideology of the PPP. The ideology of the PPP is euphemistic called democratic socialism, is it? Or, uh, so, sorry. Um, no, the PPP was a Marxist party. Yes. Uh, uh, the traditional, it, co it became a traditional communist party yes. in, in the late 60s. It joined the international, it joined communist, international movement. communist movement. So that was, it, it grew into that. It started as a, it started as a democratic socialist party. Yes. And then it drifted into Marxism, Leninism, and into the international communist movement. Now, e even as it drifted um, in that direction, you strengthened your relationship with that party. Yes, I did. So uh, did you, uh, were you a subscriber then? Oh, yes. And a subscriber now to the Marxist ideology? Then, not now. <laughs> what caused... Well, in, 19, in 1989, a lot of, you know, the, the Soviet Union collapsed in 1989. Yes, yes. And a lot of the revision took place after that period. So many of us, w w many of the things we believed at that time, believed that were true, turned out not to be true in like? the U USSR and in the socialist countries. What we, do you we say? Be we believed that, 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 the, that we believe that there was more democracy in the system under socialism than actually existed. And what in fact was being, what in fact was being w w uh, said in the West, much of it was true, uh, which we didn't believe at the time. But part of so the West was the was the the, the, um, the CIA spreading a lot of propaganda as well. That as well. That as well. And they did that in Ghana. The, yes, but much of it was true in terms of the of the, uh, the, the uh, demo democracy and um, Gorbachev. Which is a conceptual issue as well. I mean, yes. Well, you know, they would tell you, China would tell you now that it's democratic. <laughs> yeah, that's true. But Gorbachev recognized it. He himself recognized it with his policies of glasnost and perestroika. So it opened our eyes to a lot of things that we were, uh, uh, were concealed from us. Uh -huh. And they, it's also liberated, more important, I think, 
it liberated the study of Marxism uh -huh. from the confines of the scholars of the USS of the USSR. So Marxism today is considered to be a much more flexible. Uh, those who validly, those who support the validity of Marxism, is considered to be a much more f flexible ideology and a much more flexible body of opinion that allows us a, a better opportunity to understand the world in which we live and understand capitalism and how it operates. So you move from being a fervent supporter of Marxism to what? I move from being a fervent supporter. Because the party, the PPP, didn't really change in terms of its ideology, it, it in terms not, of its constitution. It hasn't changed in terms of its constitution. Well, I move from being a fervent supporter into a critical, um, a, a critical um, observer, and 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 uh, and to use Marxism as a critical analytical tool. For example, if I may mention to you. In, in 2008, when the collapse took place in the Western economies, particularly in the United States, more Marxist literature was sold than at any other time for the past 50 years. Mm -hmm. Because they all said, all the experts, the great economic experts said, that the boom and bust era that Marx talked about was over. And mm -hmm. here, what the, here it was, there was a big... Uh, a bust, <laughs> so that um, they, they, they came to the many people came to the conclusion that, like Keynes, Marx had something to say that was valid about capitalism and how it works. Mm -hmm. and, and and Keynes also, who is um, not a Marxist by any means, yes, but who also um, had ideas about how capitalism works on how to resolve some of its problems. Many people dismiss Keynes, particularly conservatives. Mm -hmm. But so Because Lord, Lord Keynes believe in expanding in, and government expenditure yes. to get an economy moving. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. So those are the tools that are now available. And if one were to use the Marxist tools in a creative way and not in a dogmatic way as was used in the past then you will certainly get benefits from understanding it. But Ralph, how would you, 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 you practice, uh, you went to the good school, you, you went to, to law school, you practice law, you reach the, the zenith of your profession, one can say it. Um, are you just an ivory tower politician, or you were then? Well, to an extent, there's always a lit little bit of ivory towerism. If one reads books, one does analysis, one writes, one discusses with people of your quality. So there is always a little bit of ivory towerism, if I may coin a phrase. But one has to always keep your feet on the ground and to understand and know what people are thinking, what they are saying, how they are living, how they are reacting to events that are happening. But, 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 but people, people, Ralph, uh, and in no society, they're not homogenous, they're not by, by any measure, any metrics. Um, they're more defined by economic circumstances. Oh, definitely. Well, that is why we go out to, to the markets. We talk to people. We've been to several markets. We've been to Borbis twice. We've been to Linden twice. And when you say we, we you now mean the, our, I, in our, our, our party, and you and United Guyana. We've been to Esquibo. We're going back to Esquibo this Saturday. So we go out and meet people and talk to people. But, but this is the problem uh, which I, why I raised uh, I, I've terrorism, as you said. 
to go out and reach the people takes a special effort. It's almost as though it's a it's a task. Whereas um it's Eddie Jagan or, or Ralph Ramgoran in, in the days when he was active in the PPP politics. You were rooted mm -hmm. in the working class. Mm -hmm. No, you're not. Yes, that is true. That is true because we don't have the support base that yes. we can go to. We had a support base at that time. Uh, I was given assignments to go and speak here, there, and everywhere. And there was a meeting organized, and I had to go. Mm -hmm. Well, not I had to go, but I went, and there were people there for me to speak to. And, and uh, uh, as a collective and individually, uh, that doesn't exist. We don't have that anymore. Mm -hmm. So basically, we have to build that and go to find the people and talk to people as we find them and find out their views. We went to representatives of various people. We went, for example, at the Linden Chamber of Commerce. I was the president but the Linden Chamber of Commerce, and you get a completely different picture from the people there as to what the politics of Linden are like mm -hmm. than what the big show that we saw recently. You get a completely <laughs> different picture of those people who every day are facing problems of setting up businesses, of encouraging people and solving problems and so on. So. And I get back to it because I, I think you yourself have, have um, written and you, you've been a prolific and, and a very informed writer. You talk about overarching and inspiring political direction, I think, um, in your article of October 5th. That's the most recent article. So what is, what is your, um, and I'm speaking of Ralph Framkran as opposed to Enoch, and we'll get to Enoch in a while. What is your overarching and inspiring political philosophy? We were invited uh, sometime during last year. <clears throat> I don't want to mention names, but we were invited by a, a friend. Many of us were invited, uh, a little bit more than half a dozen. And we were asked a few questions. One was, is there a problem in Guyana, a political problem? If the answer that person came from Mars? No, the person came from Guyana. <laughs> is there a political problem? <laughs> Two, if there is a political problem, what is the problem? Three, is there a solution to that problem? And if there is, what is the solution? So at the end of that long evening discourse, we came to the conclusion that there was a political problem. The problem was our political system, our governance structure, and that the only way that can be resolved is by political action, that civil as opposed to, say, civil society action, writing, intellectual discourses, seminars, and those kinds of things, will no longer be adequate and that we need to get into political activity. And that is what has me here. That is what, why I'm here. Um, but still, so, so there's no ideology or philosophy. No, no. It's just, we, just well, a how? Well, we came to the conclusion that we need to have a political solution. That political solution must be a system of governance that involves both political parties sharing the executive equally. But to what end, and this is what I'm trying to get from you, uh, you know, if you, if you go to Burnham, f forget the, the issues of elections and so that, that um, which is e eternally tainted, but he had an economic and a political ideology. Chedi Jagan also did. What, how would you define yours? Our uh, main, we have both political parties in Guyana today. The descendant of the Cherry, descendants of Cherry Jagan PDP and the descendants of Boran PDP have a have a social democratic approach to e economic to the economy and to politics. 
we share that same opinion. There but is but no not the democratic centralism of the no, people. No, no, no. We share that same approach. So there is no big divergence in between ourselves and the other two political parties in, the, in their, in their ide ideological posture. Now there are differences. There are big differences between the two of them. And there will be differences between ourselves and them in, in applying, in applying, the, in, de in developing policies, in determining policies, and in applying policies. Mm -hmm. There are big differences. But the orientation is basically the same. And it's the same as ours. What the biggest problem in Guyana is the ethnic insecurity problem. The ethnic problem. And that is what we believe must now be solved uh, before anything else can happen of significance but in Guyana. You place, place it in the context of ethnic in, insecurity. I want to make a, a proposition to you. It's more basic than that. You have one player in the arena that says I am not playing by democratic rules that has nothing to do with ethnic insecurity oh yes it does it that's about dictatorship oh no it has everything to do with ethnic security ethnic insecurity ethnic insecurity aren't you breeds, excusing some no, 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 seriously no 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 ethnic insecurity breeds the desire and compels the desire for ethnic dominance. And what we see playing out recently over the past year is a struggle for ethnic dominance using dictatorial means. That is what is happening. But others will tell you it's, it's, it's just a struggle to control the levers of power and enrich oneself and one's friends. And that has nothing to do with ethnic insecurity. Well, it does have a lot to do with ethnic insecurity. No, it, 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 it might help to, 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 to feather the bed, kit and kin, but that has that the, the, the essence of it. The group that each group comes to power in Guyana, and they have all come to power at one time or another, says that one was in power once, they made themselves rich, it's now our time. When this one comes to power, the other one gets in, they made themselves rich, it's now our time. But, but, but Ralph, I, that is I, what is I, I've heard a lot of this, um, but what you have, and when you talk of, of, of the two, um, these juggernauts, you have a collection of individuals at the top. Forget the people at the bottom. The people at the bottom struggling. Forget the insecurity. They're struggling. The people at the top wants to control, to enrich themselves, to stay in, in, in absolute power. That ain't got anything to do with that against the That has to do with personal greed and, and avarice and, 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 manage and control. Well, the only thing that can solve that, I believe the basis of it is ethnic dominance, but the only thing that can solve that... But that's that different from ethnic insecurity. Ethnic dominance is different. Well, it's the ethnic insecurity that leads to the struggle for ethnic dominance. The, 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 the population in Guyana, the two large race groups, would you tell feel me, would, insecure. Would, would you tell me, Ralph, that the, the key people in the APNU or in the AFC, the key people, all professionals, well-established middle class, property, land um, people, do they, do they seriously suffer from ethnic insecurity? No. And the same question I would say about the PPP. No, no, no. Exactly. No, no, they, they don't. But they're the ones holding on to, to power, but, Ralph. But this is, not, this is not a leadership issue. This is an issue of the people in Border Market and Starbrook Market, the people in Monrepo Market, the people in Better Hope, the people in Blairmont. But the it's not them Linden. fighting, it's not them fighting. But they are the people who are the ones who are feeling the, if, who are feeling the effects of the ethnic insecurity that has been, that is a historical, that is a part of the history of Guyana. Well, well, tell me this, and um, you know, uh, y your colleague 
Dr. Henry Jeffries probably somebody who could who would maybe answer questions like these. He's a political scientist. That's, so he's yes. more versed. That, that's what I'm talking about. But the people at the bottom, whether they're part of the core support of the BPP or core support of the PNC, they and the people in the market that you're talking about, they're struggling regardless of who is in power. Oh yes, but a lot of them believe a lot of the people believe that they are struggling. Indians believe that they are struggling because Africans are in power. When Indians are in power and Africans are struggling, Africans believe that they are struggling but because I am, Indians are in power. Yes, I, I, I understand that. But I'm making the point that when the Indians were in power, the masses of Indians were still struggling. Because so, there wasn't enough to go around. You, there wasn't enough. One, you have to steal and then some has to remain to go around. So after stealing, there wasn't enough to go around. Look, the PNC today, the government today would be very happy if it can find enough resources, resources to satisfy all the needs, not only of their own supporters, but of all the people of Guyana. They would be very happy to do it, but they can't because there isn't enough to go around. Well, I'm not so sure about that. I think, I think our big problem, one, you, the politics of exclusion, and that has not a lot to do with, you know, when you think, when you think, oh, we want to bring people from the diaspora, how much effort is going, we, we spend more effort into bringing people from the diaspora than to encouraging people who are here, but who are perceived to be anti-us. To, to remain. To remain yeah. and to, to, to stay in, in proper, well, a lot proper that, jobs. A lot of that is true. I, I agree with you. A lot of that is true. But um, th th this is about, uh, about you. You said only the electorate can resolve Guyana's political dilemma. We have a system where the party, whichever party, you vote for a party, it can kick you out of the National Assembly as it wishes. That's your political. How does the electorate change that? Well, the, I meant what I meant by that was and, this. And that's a quote from one of your columns. Yes. What I meant by that was this: that the electorate, if the electorate supports one or the other of the major parties, without giving it an absolute majority. Mm -hmm by giving it only a plurality. And if the electorate and if the electorate gives the smaller parties one or more enough votes to have a balance of power, mm -hmm. then the electorate will be giving us that power in order to bring about the changes that we believe are necessary to move the Anna power. You see, I go back and, and, and I, I, I stick to your article. This article of September 21, only the electorate can resolve Guyana's political dilemma. In this you say, in the penultimate paragraph, the APNU plus AFC's political antics since December 21, that's the date of the no confidence motion, its inability to accept defeat, which itself which is itself a form of arrogance, is egregious violations of the Constitution. That, that's the problem. I said. You said all of I those things. Of they cannot be trusted and will continue to victimize them at every opportunity. They, so what we have are people who are playing, I don't want to use the word game because it's, it's much bigger than that. Uh, although I saw David Hines said Jagu got into the game and Jagu lost. I don't put this in the, in the context of a no, game. No, no, not a game. It's serious business. It's extremely it's existential serious. business. Yeah. But you have identified here that the unlawful removal of the names of the electoral refusal of cabinet to resign, refusal to, to respect the court decision. Yeah. That is not ethnic. 
insecurity. That By is crude abuse of power. By itself, it's not ethnic insecurity, but it's the same kind of abuse of power that the PNC had in play between 1968 and 1985. It's the same abuse of power, but th th there's, a, there's a reason for that abuse of power, because they want to remain in office. And why they want to remain in office is because of ethnic dominance. Now, we've always, this business about the election rigging on the one side and corruption and misgovernance on the other side, or a combination, have been with us, at least the, the allegations with great um, empirical support, have been with us. Yet, this very electorate, which you are according this special um, power, has been voting these two juggernauts election after election, at yes. least those that are free and fair. Yes. So why, why would you trust this, the electorate? The electorate, we can't make a big change in the electorate's approach to political support mm -hmm. now or at any time in the near future mm -hmm. because the electorate votes on the basis of ethnicity. They've always done so and for the foreseeable future they will always do so. What we can appeal to the growing body of independent opinion in the electorate, what we can appeal to that and appeal to the supporters of the two parties who are fed up is to give us the opportunity to make a change in the governance system of Guyana by refusing to give an absolute majority to one of the parties, to either of the parties. Uh, that is what we are appealing to the electorate. A personal for. question. This question of your age. You're over 70. We have just seen Bernie Sanders in the US yeah. suddenly um, it, first you hear it was a hard bleep and then next thing you know it was a hard yeah. attack. Yeah. Um, Trump seems to survive in his madness <laughs> all the time. Um, Trump and I are the same age, we're 73. I think I, he's a few I, months I, older I, than I I hope am. that that is the only similarity <laughs> between the two of you. <laughs> yes. It is. You talked about going across Ghana. Ghana is a white country. Do you think you are young enough for the rigors of a political campaign and to run this country? The first issue is that age appears to be only an issue only in Guyana. It doesn't appear to be an issue anywhere. It's a biological fact. Let's face that's, it. We all slow down, that, Ralph. That, that, we all, we all slow down. I'm over 72 and I've slowed down. The second thing is that... Um, Old people, people of age, let me put it that way, are all over the place in politics and on other areas. For example, the, the, the um, retiring age, I understand, no longer applies in places like the United States and Canada. People work for as long as they want. Um, the politicians who are running in Canada, there's Trump, there's Bernie Sanders, there's uh, Elizabeth Warren. Warren. Uh, in, 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 in London, there is, in UK, there is um, Bernard Corbyn, I'm not, um, uh, <laughs> Jeremy know, Corbyn, Jeremy, Jeremy yeah. Corbyn is a little bit younger than, than we are. Boris Johnson but, is younger too. <laughs> and, well, Boris Johnson is still very young, he's in his 50s. But, so, my health is good. Um, I visit doctors frequently. I have medical checkups frequently. As far as I'm aware, my heart is in good condition good. and so on. So I think I have the physical capability. I'm physically active. I was, you know, my part. I have offered my resignation from my employment. As you know, I'm employed at Cameron and Shepherd. I hold the senior post and I have offered my resignation. So my partner said, no, 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 you're not going anywhere. So I, I, be, I believe I have the 
ability and the capacity to um, to serve the country if called upon to do so. But but I, 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 th I think it is it is generally um, agreed that the, the ideal age for, for political leadership should probably be 45 to late 50s. It could be, yes, 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 yes. Now, let's take David Granger. Well, take you, because you're about the same age, aren't you? Yeah, we're about Good. the same age. What's the life expectancy of Ghana? Of the average guy in his mail. Yeah, yeah. It's, yeah it's, but it's, that's in, an average. In the 70s. It's always well. No, it's it's not for men. It's less than seventy. Okay, okay. But um, you're talking for you to serve a full term. Let's say you were um, elected president. I'll be seventy-eight and at the end of a full term. Yes. If I'm president. And would that make you the oldest president to have served in Ghana? No, um, Chedi was elected at 74, and he died at 79. Okay. He was, uh, so he would have been the oldest. So you don't see age as a factor? I don't see age as a factor, no. But if, 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 if I am, um, if age is a factor in relation to me, uh, I have colleagues of, of, you know, of quality who are younger than I am. But they're not the presidential candidate. But they're not the presidential candidate. But I don't see age as a factor in Guyana. Look, Henry Jeffrey always says, Barnum and Jagan screwed up Guyana and they were young men, you know. <laughs> why, why you want young men? He also says that Barra Jag, they screwed up Guyana and he was a young man. So what is this thing about age? Now that's Henry Jeffrey talking. So what would you say of Granger? And, and screwing up? disappointing, you know. A lot of people had great hopes. Uh, in Granger when the PPP, when, when they took over. A lot of people had great hopes that things would be different. Of, of all the presidents, and we, we've heard a lot of things said about Burnham, but of all the presidents we've heard, who, which president, in your opinion, as a senior counsel, third law politician, commentator, writer, which president has mo done more damage to the constitution and the body politic of Guyana? In your opinion? Well, it would be difficult to surpass what Barnum did um, because of the rigged elections and yes. so on. But the, this, this, this government has done a great deal of harm to our constitution by refusing to observe the constitutional provisions and the cabinet but, is in By power. refusing to, to observe a decision of the, the uh, highest of, court. Of the court and the cabinet. That is, is lawlessness. Office. The cabinet is in office. Up for, for one thing, and I. You know, and I'm, I'm no big defender of Burnham. He blocked me from getting work at all, but yes. that's all right. But at least he tried to add a veneer of, of cover himself in a veneer of legality. Yeah. This, this lot, this lot is beer feast. Um, you mentioned Henry Jeffrey. When your party was announced, you had a couple, you have Terence Campbell, you had Terence Campbell. Yeah. Then you had Benny Sankar. Came on later, yeah. Um, Henry Jeffrey was there. Yeah. But they don't seem, well, Campbell left you very early. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, he caught and run. Yeah, and then Benny Sankar left. Um, Henry Jeffrey doesn't take a really active role in the party. He's not on the executive anymore. He's not on the executive. He's a member of the um, he's a member of the party, and he has attended executive meetings from time to time. But he was a founder member, wasn't he? He was a founder member of the party. And then he but he chose he chose not to act to take a seat on the executive for good reason. He said, "Look, I'm 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 of age." <laughs> uh, let the young, and he was saying that to let you. the young people <laughs> saying that to me. And let the young people move forward. But he had in mind, even then, he had m in mind me as the presidential candidate. So I would not have been allowed. A bit of a paradox. I would not have been allowed to, um, to not go on the executive. And yes, so he, but he attends executive meetings. But those things must have hurt. Ter Terence Campbell. Mm -hmm. um, Terence Campbell was very hurtful because he's a very good person. Um, he's a very active person. He, 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 he has, you know, some views and capacity to organize. He knows a lot of people, and he has great resources, both 
his own personal but, resources. But he put his personal resources be above the, the national well, good. Yeah, well. Now, do you feel that that has harmed the party? It certainly could not be a plus. It's not a plus. It has harmed us because it, 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 uh, it tells people don't, uh, don't um, join ANO. Don't join those people. But look, uh, even Timothy Jonas, from, from the very early days, who was offered silk, senior counsel, the offer was withdrawn. The offer was made. The party was announced. And then the offer was withdrawn within a week. So other persons have suffered. So the message has gone out to people. Leave those people alone. There are a lot of people who, when we were in the formation stage, who indicated an interest in coming forward and openly. Uh, a lot of that interest has died out. Not that they're not supporters, but to present themselves openly to us. What does your party stand for? I, I think there was an announcement in the, uh, the announcement of your own election indicated that there was a group within the party working on a manifesto. Yeah, we have a manifesto. But what does this? What does the party stand for? Well, the party stand for first and most important a new system of governance which will bring unity to Guyana. It will not bring ethnic unity, it will bring unity in governance. Mm -hmm. It will create a stable political system. Um, and that, that system will work equality at the executive level. The parliamentary system, there will be representative according to votes. Mm -hmm. So you'll have a representative system there. Um, and we'll alter the, try to alter the electoral system to have more constitu to have constituencies in a real sense and have a very small number of um, top up seats mm -hmm. so that you get a balance uh, proportionately so we'll revamp we're offering to revamp that system in terms of the economy in the two big problems we, we face are corruption and crime and we believe that the nature of the governance system that we have will itself uh, help to eliminate, help to reduce corruption at least. And we need to put more resources as we get them from the, um, from the oil resources into, into reducing corruption and crime. Those are the things that we need to, 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 to deal with. In terms of the economy, the, um, a multiplicity of things we have, but, to, but you know, like uh, electricity, infrastructure, and all well, of well, those are really infrastructure issues. Yeah. But, 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 Ralph, we, we, what kind of taxation would you want to have? Would you want to tax? What would be the, the key objective of your tax system? Is it is it that it's going to be, revenue producing? Is it that it's going to be, equitable? Is it that it's going to be simplicity of administration or is it going to be this redistribution because you have in this country some people who are stinkingly rich and some people who are grovelingly poor how would you use your tax system to deal with that well, well the tax this the issue of tax taxation has always been extremely painful to me at a personal level <laughs> because every cent that comes into our office is receipted and put and, and recorded and there are not two sets of recordings there's one one recording and it goes to the inland you're not accusing my profession no no, no no creating no, no. double books no, no, no. <laughs> the profession doesn't create it it's the people who the people who create it oh, we just shut our eyes said <laughs> yes go on. no you get what you deal with what you're presented and you're presented with one set of books but so it pains me to see, and even in our profession, you know, that so the first thing that we need to do is to reduce the tax burden by collecting income tax from people who don't pay. 
Should you the, have a progressive system of taxation? There must be a progressive system of taxation. Um, the people who earn more pay more. Uh, no, and, uh, but, but you, you, progressive means as your income, as your taxable income goes up, the rate of tax goes up as well. Yeah. So you yeah. believe in that? That's yeah. a progressive system. Yes, that's the system that operates now. Is that the problem? No, no, it doesn't. It doesn't. We have a system. Jordan didn't realize it. Jordan actually introduced a regressive system oh, when he well, thought he was uh, introduced. But I pay a high rate. Yeah, but you pay, a high, you pay a high rate of 40% on two-thirds because you then get a one-third personal allowance. Okay. Jordan did not, on, j did not know what he was doing. That's what I'm, we have. A, we have a regressive income tax system. We have value-added tax that is also largely regressive. So what what is Eno going to do about the tax system? Well, I can't answer that in detail, but but we obviously need a tax system that is fair and a tax system where those who earn higher amounts pay a higher a higher tax, and hopefully with the introduction of more resources in, into Guyana, we'll be able to bring down the, the rate of tax. For example, people have spoken about the property tax, that it doesn't bring much to the economy, and um, it, it's, it's, uh, it it's should be uh, removed. People have said so. I, I, I don't know what the basis of their argument, but people have one is the property tax, two well, the capital gains tax. People have said that property tax is in fact um, double taxation. I think that's nonsensical. They say, look, you've already paid tax on it. The fact is you have not. In many cases, it's accumulated wealth comes from tax avoided sources or from non so from non income earnings. So I don't think that that's, that's necessarily true. Um, Property taxes it helps to redistribute. It also helps the Guyana Revenue Authority to know well. Okay, um, if this person has a hundred thousand in year one, and at the end of year two has two hundred fifty thousand, their net worth has gone up by one hundred fifty thousand. They would have had living expenses. Then they must be making quite a bit of money. Yeah. So, but so so you would Enog would stand for a progressive system of that and it would raise the tax rates no i can't see that i can't see that i i, I, I don't believe the tax rates should if if there's income coming in that the tax rate should be raised no i think we should try to find what do you think what what reduce. do you ralph um on uh, this need not be a party's position i don't hold you to this um what do you think about all this this concentration of wealth and this vast disparity much, much less than 1% controls the much of the economic resources of the country. That, and I'm not talking about all, but the rest of the economy. Well, <laughs> these things have to be addressed. How they, how they, how they are addressed, I, I don't know. But there are means, you see it going on in the United States at the moment. There are means of ta taxation methods and means and instruments. By you mean like what Trump did? No, no, made, no, no, no. Made his, he said he made them rich. Elizabeth Warren. Elizabeth Warren. Oh, oh okay. <laughs> Elizabeth um, one that's from one extreme to the other. <laughs> we're, we're, um, you know, people who don't pay taxes, like what they did to the lawyers. They said lawyers don't pay taxes. That's the previous the Jagdeo administration. Lawyers don't pay taxes. So the annual fee for lawyers went up and up and up and up and up but we pay taxes uh -huh. so what happens to us uh -huh. we pay more taxes than half the legal profession five of us pay more taxes than half the legal profession so what happens to us we are caught by those that those means too. well so well a sensible approach would be to give a credit for the license for that 250 which you yeah. Of course, you lawyers have locked it in the court system yeah. from since 2003, I oh, think. Oh, we pay it. No, you only pay 10000 now. No, no, no. We pay, the, we pay the full amount. But you shouldn't have to pay. The, the, court, the court decision is that you don't have to pay. That's, that's the court decision. Well, I don't deal with it, but I know that it's paid. 
I am not so sure about that. We pay it. Um, we pay Well, you we shouldn't. Why would you pay, pay more than you, you have to pay legally? Well, I'm not aware of the court decision. Yeah, man, you know that that, that, that was... It, was a, there was an injunction Yes, of some and it sort. still is in place. Yeah. And nobody's moving, doing anything about it, including the government. Campaign financing. What is your party's position? We talk about these ill-gotten gains by various sections. And yet we go to them and the very people to ask for money. Would, how would, what's your, your party's policy in terms of raising funds? We will accept donations from sources that we consider to be honest and, 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 and not involved in any activity. We, that's the basis on which, we, we, the only basis on which we can function. Uh, we will not publish the names unless other political parties do so. If there's a law, so we wouldn't rise above the standards of the other parties. We wouldn't rise above the standards of the other parties because when when we begin publishing names, all sources of income will dry up, and we will have to close shop. Because what happened to Terence Campbell will happen to all the people who give us, and we will have to close shop. Where there is a law, or all the other parties agree to publish names. We will agree to do so, but I have to warn that once you do so, you have to have some kind of state support system for political parties because income income will dry up. You know, Ralph, we, we often hear we don't have any campaign financing legislation. We That's not quite some. true. We, we do. do have. We, we have. do have. But all the parties break it. Uh, is your party going to break it as well? No. With the I threshold set out in the laws. I, I, no, but we, there is an affidavit that you have to, to do. I mean, but the threshold is very small. Um, $1,500 or $15,000. No, a little or bit more than that, yes. It, but something it, like that. Impossible. But so so um, your party would, would violate that rule? Well, I don't know how we'll violate it. We will certainly, I don't, can't say we'll violate it, but we'll certainly find ways and means in which we can expend enough resources without violating the law. We're lawyers. That's Remember, <laughs> we're lawyers. <laughs> well, <laughs> without violating the law to, uh, to I, do I, our I, business. I don't think the other members of your party will say that um, you're lawyers. You're, you're a party. You would like to be a broad-based party. Yeah. yeah. Um, would you take money from the oil companies? I don't know. Um, you know, Raymond Gaskin was in the media a couple of days ago yeah, saying yeah. that the, the oil companies will de decide who but, win the elections. I, I, I don't believe the oil companies will give any money to anybody. But, but um, that's not an issue that I can answer. If all the parties, if let's take the most prominent oil company, Exxon, if Exxon decides publicly that they will give the political parties. They're not going to do that. They're going to do it privately. Well, if they if they give the political parties privately and they give all the political parties, the they're same not going to do that either. The same amount. Well, no. Man, they, well, well, they wouldn't even tell you what signing bonus <laughs> they pay the country. <laughs> they're going to tell you what they get political that, parties. That's very dangerous to to consider taking money from oil, the oil yes. company, especially uh, in so the current situation. As a matter of principle, it would be very dangerous. And I, we haven't made a decision on that, but I doubt whether the members of our executive will agree to accept money from oil companies. You, you've been around. Um, ageable is the word sometimes I hear you use. Yeah. <laughs> or, or, or of age. Yeah, or ageable. ageable. Yeah, of age. um, what is your heart of ha heart of heart? realistic expectation of ENOG in elections whenever they're held because I'm not one that believes in GCOM telling me anything. I think they're an incompetent and a dishonest bunch. Yeah. And I'll say that. Yeah. I've said it. Yeah. What's in your heart of heart the, expectation? Um, elections? Yes. And, and the, and the, uh, I, I, I'm hoping that the elections will be free, free and fair. And I, I, I don't see any means, any substantial or significant means by which the elections can be tampered with. Well, you said in your September 28th column, the objective of the moves by GCOM is clearly to remove names from the list mm -hmm. in violation 
of a decision by the Chief Justice. That's an illegality. Uh, uh, That's an illegality. Yes, that is what they were planning to do. That's what they were planning to do. And you don't think they're going to find other means of doing it? When Granger, when when Granger unconstitutionally appointed James Patterson to the position, mm -hmm. unilaterally and unconstitutionally, yeah. What, what do you think was the motive behind that? Well, the motive behind that was to interfere with the election. But they are being stopped at every stage. Are they? At every stage, they are being blocked. When that was exposed, the, the attempt to um, remove names from the list, when that was exposed, it was stopped. It was blocked. Well, we have, and I'm going to, we, we got three minutes. I want your senior legal opinion. This government ceased to be legal, having stretched it out from March to September 18. What is the status of this government? What's the status of the cabinet? And what's the status of the government? Well, the cabinet is, is holding office unlawfully because it should have resigned a long time ago. Yes. So the cabinet is not... That's 106. Legal. Yeah. Six. The government, I would say, is in de facto power, but not in de jure power. But can you Whole claim office. de facto? Can you claim your, your friend? There is no legal basis for to claim that they are lawfully in power. There is no legal basis for the government to claim that it's lawfully in office. You know, you know. It's just de facto. A bandit in goes and, and takes up and and assumes possession and says, "Look, I'm de facto uh, occupant of this house." Yeah, that is true, but. But we're, different, we're dealing with a different kind of reality. The, the Unconstitutional reality? No, the international community accepts the existence of the government. Which Do they? Poor. Do they? Well, Ralph, they have not called for the government to resign. Well, tell None me of them has called for the something. government to resign. Does Article 1067 not require that the elections be held within... A yes, certain time, unless does. extended it does. by the National it, Assembly, it does. by a two-thirds. Now, does. it has passed the three months. Yeah. So therefore, the only limb that it can hang its peg on is an extension. Yes. It has not had that extension. Yes. So what is its status? As I said, it's, it has only a de facto status. It does not have a de jure status. Nice fancy legal language. But well, uh, that's the only language in which I can... No, I but can, that's bully. That's, that's, but a, that's the schoolyard bully. If I say, if, if I say to you that the government is, in a, is holding office illegally, yes. there's the next question. Mm -hmm. Should they resign? Or should they, if they don't resign... Well, what they, do you do with an removed? illegal situation? You bring well, it to an end. The answer, yes, they should resign. And yes, they should call elections, or yes, resign, and, and then do what? I, I mean, what do you then do? I see Bisram is calling for the Chief Justice, for the Chancellor to be... Well, that's my... I have said that before. I, I was on a panel. I was on a panel. This government is illegal. There's no question about it. You're yes. a lawyer. Yes, yes. Well, give the Chancellor the presidency. <laughs> <laughs> And let's see, let's see if she, well, the, 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 chancellor will, the chancellor will not rest if she hears these comments. Well, she's <laughs> the one who had a um, slight problem with um, majority. Eh? Yes. Yes. Um, Ralph, uh, on that note, I want to thank you very much for appearing on Play Talk. I wish you well. I think it's a bold decision. Yes. Um, so and I, I must wish you continued health and well-being. Um, Good luck to your party, and uh, as it seeks to address some of the myriad problems that we in Ghana face, not least of which is an illegal government. Thank you very so much. So thank you, thank operators you. and viewers. Thank you, and good night.